The volar slab splint is usually applied as a temporary measure to be used while swelling decreases in fractures and soft tissue injuries of the distal forearm, wrist, and hand prior to the application of a longer-term circular cast. In this presentation, the application of the volar slab will be demonstrated. The volar slab is indicated for forearm and wrist fractures with significant swelling, wrist sprains and fractures, and undisplaced metacarpal fractures. To apply the volar slab, the following materials are needed. A stockinette or tubular gauze bandage. Cotton wool, 100 millimeters wide, will be used as undercast padding. For children, a width of 75 millimeters is sufficient. Scissors. A plaster slab, generally five layers thick and available in differing widths. In this case, a 150 millimeter slab will be used. For a smaller patient, a smaller slab may be appropriate. A crepe bandage, used to secure the plaster slab. And water, or another wetting agent. The water should be tepid or lukewarm with an ideal temperature of between 22 and 25 degrees Celsius. It should be noted that colder water or a bandage that is wetter will allow for an increased working time, while warmer water or a bandage that is drier reduces the working time. The patient should be seated next to a table or trolley, with the elbow at the edge of the table to allow full access to the forearm and wrist. The proximal border of the volar slab is about two fingers below or distal to the crease of the elbow or the cubical fossa. The distal border is located no lower than the distal palmar crease so that the patient is still able to flex the MP joints to 90 degrees. The volar slab should allow the patient continued use of the thumb so the thumb should remain open. To begin, a stockinette is applied and cut slightly longer than the final cast will be. A small opening is cut for the thumb. A slit is cut in the cotton wool to go through the first web space. The cotton wool is gently wound on, giving an overlap of 50%. The overlap creates a double layer of padding, which is sufficient for most injuries. It should be kept in mind that the more padding that is applied, the less rigid the support to the injury site. Consequently, more than two layers of padding are not normally recommended. The slab is cut to length with a space for the thumb. The slab is wettened by pulling it through the water. The excess water is removed by squeezing it slightly. The slab is applied. Because the slab is still too soft to mold to the desired shape, the excess material is removed using the scissors. To create a smooth edge, the ends of the stockinette are folded over the two ends of the slab. The stockinette around the thumb is cut and folded over the plaster. The slab is secured in place by winding a crepe bandage around the forearm and wrist. The bandage should pass through the first web space.
The plaster should be molded to the palm of the hand and first web space to increase stability and prevent rotation. It should be noted that the plaster is still soft and can be molded. The plaster will not achieve full strength for 36 hours. The plaster is molded by applying pressure to the radius depending on the type of fracture. If flexion of the wrist is desired, it can be achieved now by molding. To secure a better fit, the molding of the slab should take into account the oval profile of the forearm. The slab is now molded to the palm of the hand, while the fingers are flexed to an angle of 90 degrees. The exercises for the patient may now be explained and demonstrated. They include full flexion of the MP joints, full flexion of the PIP joints, and placing the ends of the fingers into the palm of the hand, as shown here. Flexion of the thumb is verified. Because of the relatively small space between the heads of the first and second metacarpals, the volar slab should not be too wide in the web space, so that the patient can continue to pinch the thumb and fingers together. The application of the volar slab is now complete.